Before we start today's episode, I want to announce that Brain Science is now available on Pandora. So if you use Pandora, you can subscribe just like you subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and other podcasting apps. Podcasts are a brand new feature on Pandora, so I'm really proud that Brain Science is part of the inaugural rollout. Welcome to Brain Science, the podcast that explores how recent discoveries in neuroscience are unraveling the mystery of how our brain makes us human. I'm your host, Dr. Ginger Campbell, and this is episode 153. Before I introduce today's guest, I want to remind you that you can find complete show notes and episode transcripts at brainsciencepodcast.com. You can send me feedback at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com or submit voice feedback at speakpipe.com forward slash Doc Artemis or use the SpeakPipe app. Today's guest is Dr. John Dowling, and we are going to talk about his latest book, Understanding the Brain, From Cells to Behavior to Cognition. Dr. Dowling teaches at Harvard, where he has been studying the neuroscience of vision for decades. He has also written many books, including one called Vision, which he wrote with his brother Joseph just a few years ago. I was very eager to have Dr. Dowling on Brain Science because I actually featured another one of his books, The Great Brain Debate, Nature or Nurture, way back in episode four. After this interview, I will review the key ideas and I'll also tell you how you can win free books and Amazon gift certificates. I'll also tell you how you can get episode four for free. Well, John, it's a great honor to have you on Brain Science. After all these years of doing the show, I'd like to start out by asking you to tell us a little bit about your career as a scientist, especially since you started before neuroscience was recognized as a discipline of its own. Sure. Let me uh, tell you a little bit about my background. My father was a physician as is my brother, and I was following in their footsteps as an undergraduate at Harvard, pre-med. And uh, where my path really changed was in my junior year when I took a biochemistry course from a professor here, George Walls, who discovered the role of vitamin A in vision. And uh, it was a phenomenal course, and it really got me thinking about doing research. It was a year-long course, and in the spring of that year, I asked him if I could join his laboratory that summer and try my hand at research. I had long been interested in scientific matters as, as a boy growing up, loved to build things, take things apart. I had an erector set, a very elaborate electric train set, used to make everything from uh, radios to what have you. So when I got into the laboratory as a junior at Harvard, I just found it wonderful to do what I was learning how to do and being taught to do. So not only did I stay in the laboratory that summer, but I then spent virtually my entire senior year continuing a research project that Professor Walt had suggested that I undertake. And uh, it was a wonderful year. But I had applied to medical school and did go off to medical school at the end of my senior year at Harvard. But odd afternoons, I would come back to the laboratory. Professor Wall kept a desk available for me, and I continued the research through the summer between my first and second years at medical school. And then at the end of the second year of medical school, I decided to take a year off. That's between the basic science years and the clinical years in medical school to spend one more year during research. So I took a leave of absence from the Harvard Medical School, and I'm still on that leave of absence. (laughs) Now, 60 years later, because that was 1959, no regrets at all. But I did enjoy the first two years of medical school, but I certainly have enjoyed my career as a scientist since. So so you've been doing sort of vision research ever since you were an undergraduate? I did. I began it as an undergraduate. Professor Wald, as I mentioned earlier, discovered the role of vitamin A in vision. That is, a modified form of vitamin A, vitamin A aldehyde, 
combines with the protein in the light-sensitive, photosensitive cells in the eye to form what is called a visual pigment that, when excited by a photon of light, initiates the process of vision. So the project that he put me onto as an undergraduate was what happened when vitamin A is withdrawn from an animal? Indeed, what it does, and this had long been known, actually, there evidence of this going back to the ancient Egyptian medical papyri, that something in the diet is important to maintain good vision. And then in the beginning of the 20th century, when the vitamins were discovered, it was recognized that the critical nutrient to maintain good vision was vitamin A. And it was then shown that vitamin A is present in the retina, but what role does it play? That was where Wald came in and showed that indeed it's a modified form of vitamin A, vitamin A aldehyde, bound to a protein in the photoreceptor cells that form the light-sensitive molecules that initiate all of vision. So I was assigned the project of looking to see in an animal what happens during vitamin A deficiency because there had been some studies, one very prominent one during the Second World War, in which some puzzles appeared. That is that they found that if they took conscientious objectors who were the subjects of these studies and they put them on a vitamin A deficient diet, very often the students, and they were mainly students, would go on for six months, a year, a year and a half, and show no signs of the deficiency. And what was going on? It was known then, of course, that vitamin A is stored in the liver. Could it be, it was thought, that there was sufficient vitamin A in the liver to maintain then good vision for a year or two on a vitamin A deficient diet? So that was one of the questions. A second one that he asked me to look at was in prolonged vitamin A deficiency, there were some subjects that did show what we call nutritional night blindness. When you gave them back vitamin A, they showed partial recovery, but not complete recovery. At least for months, they remained somewhat night blind. And indeed, it was that finding that really put the end to those clinical studies, because the worry was, could it be that you could permanently affect vision if you kept a person on a vitamin A deficient diet more or less indefinitely? The idea was that perhaps in prolonged vitamin A deficiency, that the protein to which the vitamin A aldehyde attaches denatures. And there was some evidence that free protein as compared to the protein to which the vitamin A aldehyde was bound was less stable. And so that was something to test. And that was uh, really the project that I undertook as an undergraduate. And along the way, of course, I got interested in a number of other things. What do the cells look like when they're falling apart in vitamin A deficiency, if they're falling apart? What happens to vision when you don't have a full complement of visual pigment? So, for example, I learned how to record the responses of the eyes of the animals I was using then, which were rats and could show that as the vitamin A disappeared, first from the liver, then from the blood, then, of course, the visual pigment levels, the rod visual pigment levels, now called rhodopsin, begin to decrease. And with that, there's a decrease in visual sensitivity. The interesting thing there is that it's not a linear decrease, but a log linear decrease. In other words, if you lost 50% of the visual pigment, the threshold doesn't go up by twofold, which would be a linear relationship, but it goes up by log units, three, four, five log units. All of that I was doing in my, as an undergraduate. My first paper came out in 1958, my first year in medical school. But then, and this may be of interest to a number of the listeners, we did find that in prolonged vitamin A deficiency, that the protein does decline. And as that happens, the animals show other signs of vitamin A deficiency. In other words, vitamin A plays roles other than just in vision. So, for example, 
epithelial cells begin to die, and eventually an animal on a vitamin A deficient diet will die. That was the project that I undertook when I came back after two years of medical school to do the following, and that is what had been shown early, early on during the synthesis of vitamin A, that if you made a precursor of vitamin A, vitamin A acid, vitamin A aldehydes needed provision, vitamin A is the vitamin that you get in the diet, vitamin A acid, which was not known to exist before, if you gave vitamin A acid to animals on a deficient diet, it was as though you gave them vitamin A. And the question was, was vitamin A acid the critical component of vitamin A or the critical molecule that maintained animals who have been supplemented with vitamin A itself? Now, the interesting thing here is that it's very difficult for tissues to reduce acid to alcohols or aldehydes in the body. And so the hypothesis that we set out to test was if you gave an animal vitamin A acid on a deficient diet and could take care of all the somatic functions of vitamin A, would the animal go blind because that requires vitamin A aldehyde and it's hard for tissues to reduce vitamin A acid to vitamin A aldehyde. And that turned out to be correct. Today, we call vitamin A acid retinoic acid. And of course, it has a big role in the cosmetic industry. That's retin A. And why it works so well cosmetically in reducing wrinkles and reducing acne is that it causes the proliferation of epithelial cells filling in the wrinkles. Anyway, (laughs) more of a story than perhaps you really wanted to uh, hear, but it's fun to talk about. Well, I want to talk about vision some more as we move along, but today we were going to talk a little bit about your most recent book, Understanding the Brain. The version of it that I have is called Understanding the Brain from Cells to Behavior to Cognition. Is that the final name? Because I... Yes, that that was final name that we gave to Okay, because I only have a pre-publication copy, and sometimes the names get changed. <laughs> it was published formally at the end of October, so the copies are available, and I'll be delighted to send you one. Well, if you do that, I will gift it to a listener. Okay, very good. <laughs> so, can you start out by just giving us a little bit of an overview of this new book? Sure. The book is really to try to answer Where are we today in understanding the brain? But something else that I think is very important, and that is, where do we go from here? What needs to be done? What are the big issues? Now, I divide the book into three sections. First, on neurobiology, what I call the nuts and bolts of understanding how neuronal cells work. And then systems neuroscience, how do aggregates of neurons underlie behavior? And then finally, we approach cognitive neuroscience, higher brain function, what we often refer to as mind. And of course, there has been a huge revolution in cognitive neuroscience due to brain imaging, which has come very much to the fore in the last 20, 25 years. So whereas when I was an undergraduate and even a graduate student, Most psychologists viewed the brain as a black box. Today, that's no longer the case. No psychologist that I know of views the brain as a black box because now with brain imaging, we can begin to assign functions to specific brain areas. So what needs to be done? Well, let's go back first to neurobiology where there has been great progress made in the last 75 to 100 years. We really understand an enormous amount about how individual neurons and glial cells, but let's focus on the neurons, how they work, how they receive information, how they integrate information, how they transmit information, primarily at synapses. And when things go wrong with the neurons, with how they're transmitting information, for example, in multiple sclerosis or when you have mental disease, which appear to affect mainly 
synaptic function. All of this is being worked out in enormous detail and is a huge, huge, huge success. Systems neuroscience, how do aggregates of neurons underlie behavior? We're beginning to get at that, and there are some wonderful examples from invertebrates, which have simpler nervous systems, fewer neurons, and so on and so forth. And also, we have a fair amount of information on this from better understood parts of the vertebrate brain. And I think the classic example, the best example, is the visual system, where we can follow information flow through at least six, seven neurons from the retina of the eye into the cerebral cortex and see what the transitions are from first the photoreceptors receiving light to the neurons in the cortex, how they analyze the visual information coming into the brain. As far as cognitive neuroscience is concerned, again, imaging has proven to be a tremendous forward step, but what we don't really understand very well yet is the circuitry understanding cognitive neuroscience circuitry of the brain or the underlying neurobiology. And that's where I think we need to go. And that is to begin to understand first the simple aggregates of neurons, simple behaviors, better understood parts of the brain and bring that understanding at the neurobiological level up to cognitive neuroscience. Some progress is being made here and there, and uh, that's wonderful, but we have a long way to go. My own guess is that it will occupy much of the present century. What was the intended audience for your new book? Well, uh, let me give you a little background of the book. In the late 90s, I wrote a book called Creating Mind, which was intended mainly for the non-specialist for the non-neurobiologist, really for the lay public. It has been received very, very well. It went through seven printings and sold a fair number of copies. Not, of course, enough to get it on the bestseller list, but (laughs) nevertheless, for a science book, I think it did reasonably well. After 20 years, it seemed to me it was time to redo the book. And when I approached Norton, who published the book, about doing this, they suggested that I expand it further, bring it up to date, and make it available, again, mainly for the non-specialists, for the lay public, but in particular for those areas that brain sciences are important, i.e. philosophy of mind, linguistics, how do animals learn to speak, and so on and so forth, and what we can do about that. Computer science, an enormous amount of interest in how the brain functions by the computer scientists who are attempting to model aspects of brain function and so on and so forth. So the idea of the book was to make it available then to students who are in allied areas of inquiry where brain science now has some applicability. And so that is one area that we were interested in having the book appeal to an audience. So that's one area. Secondly, again, I think the book is accessible for people who have had high school science. So it would be the more general public. I have used the book, and one other faculty member has already, who got early copies, in freshman seminars here at Harvard. And these seminars are designed not for students going on in science, but for students who, as high school students, enjoyed science, are interested in the brain, and have that level of science expertise. And so that was the intended audience for the book. Because I've been doing this show for 12 years now, I don't do general neuroscience books very much anymore, but it's good to have one every now and then, especially for the sake of new listeners who are just getting started and want a book that can give them a great overview of the field, which I think your book does. One of the questions that you brought out or ideas that you brought out has to do with the difference between neurons and other cell types. That is to say, 
neurons are cells, but how are they different from other cells? Yeah, there are two interesting differences. For the most part, we find that there are in neurons all of the biochemical mechanisms that we find in all cells. But there are two facets of brain cells that differ somewhat. First of all, brain cells have an absolute requirement for oxygen. What that means is that if oxygen to the cells decreases, the cells quickly die. Within five minutes of losing oxygen to a neuron, it will begin to die. That's very different from other cells in the body. So, for example, a muscle cell. When you run 100 yards, your muscles probably run out of oxygen after you've only run about 30 yards. You then provide the energy for those muscle cells by breaking down glucose to smaller molecules. But in that process, you don't require oxygen. Oxygen is required to break down glucose and the smaller molecules to carbon dioxide and water. We call that operating anaerobically without oxygen. And uh, neurons cannot do that to any great extent. And so they die very readily, very easily when oxygen is withdrawn. So, for example, if there's stroke to a portion of the brain or a heart attack so that oxygen to the brain is cut off, what dies first are the neurons. And, you know, we hear about brain dead people because they've lost oxygen going into the brain. But it's possible then, after some time, to bring back the muscles, the respiration, the liver, the heart, you name it, everything can be brought back. So that's one very special difference between neurons and other cells elsewhere in the body, the absolute requirement for oxygen. The one good thing about that difference is that that's the basis for brain imaging. That is, that when a part of the brain is active, it requires oxygen. And so the brain imaging techniques, for the most part, what they're looking at is the increase in blood flow to a part of the brain that's operating. So brain imaging then depends on if you're looking to see what area lights up in the brain or what area is involved in a visual task, what you do is you're looking at the increase of blood flow to that part of the brain that's taking on that task. Now, the other big difference is that once a neuron has differentiated, and this happens very early on, in fact, most of our neurons are born in the first four months of gestation, then, of course, towards the rest of gestation and then in the early days, the neurons develop more processes, more synapses. They make more refined connections and so on and so forth. And all of that goes on for many years. In fact, the human brain probably isn't fully developed until a person is about 20 years of age so that there's an enormous then restructuring of the brain from birth when you have most of your brain cells to 20 years of age. But as the cells develop, as they differentiate, and most of them differentiate very early on, they can't de-differentiate and proliferate. So, for example, if you cut your skin with a razor or something, what happens is that very quickly the surrounding cells begin to proliferate. Many of them de-differentiate as that happens, and very quickly the wound is healed, and you see no evidence of there being a cut very quickly. That doesn't happen in the brain. Once you lose brain cells, you've lost them permanently. And indeed, after age 20, there is a slight decrease of brain cells that occurs in most regions of the brain, if not all regions of the brain, as you age. And indeed, my view is that it's probably aging of brain cells that limits our absolute lifespan, whereas, of course, the average lifespan of humans has increased enormously since the beginning of the 20th century, from something like 47 years of age in the West 
including the United States up to today, the average lifespan of about 80, that's as far as we're going. In other words, the oldest person is well documented was 122 years of age, and she died 20 years ago. No one has gone over 120 years since. So the guess is that something really limits absolute lifespan so that what we've done, though, is to increase average lifespan from, say, 50 years of age up to 85 years of age. But now we seem to be on a plateau. And indeed, I was reading in the paper just the other day that the average lifespan of males in the United States has actually decreased for the last two years. Not very much, but it indicates we're pretty much on a plateau. Now, what significance does that have that you cannot regenerate your neurons from pre-existing neurons that have differentiated? It means that there are a few, if any, stem cells in the brain. Stem cells, of course, are cells that can differentiate into any kind of cell. And if present in the brain, presumably, could provide new neurons or other types of cells essential in the brain. But that doesn't seem to happen. There are two places in the brain, at least most animals, where there are a few stem cells. One is in the olfactory part of the brain. That doesn't seem to exist in humans. And the other is in the hippocampus of the brain, which is involved in the storage of long-term memories, the consolidation of memories, if you will. But there's even some question as to whether in older human beings, those stem cells still are there. So it's very much up in the air. But the bottom line is that for the most part, once we have all of our neurons, and again, that has been pretty much completed by the time you're born, although there is a development of individual cells thereafter, you're stuck with that number of cells. So what about the electrical activity of neurons? If someone asked me that question, that would have probably been the first thing I would have said <laughs> was different compared to other types of cells. Certainly, you know, neurons carry information electrically. They make connections with one another, mainly chemically. Of course, that communication First of all, being able to generate electrical potentials to excite neurons and then for those excited neurons to carry electrical signals long distances. So, for example, neuron in your spinal cord that innervates the toes of your feet could be as long as a meter. That's an enormous distance to go relative to the size, for example, of a motor neuron, which is only about 100 micrometers in diameter. So if you took a neuron and you made it, say, six inches across, and then you drew its axon of a motor neuron innervating the toes of your feet, you'd have to draw an axon, which is the process along which the electrical activity propagates. You'd have to make it a mile long. That's pretty amazing. It is. It's really amazing. So that's the way you excite neurons electrically. You do it, and then you propagate information along the axons, and that's very efficient. I haven't talked much about neuronal structure, but, of course, when you see a neuron, it looks like a star with many processes coming off, and those are the dendrites on which the input to the cell is made. The so-called input synapses come in mainly on the dendrite. Most vertebrate neurons then have one axon, and it's at where the axon comes off the cell body that the electrical signals that are propagated down the axon are generated. And then when they get to the end of the axon to what we call the axon terminals where information is passed on to other cells or to effector organs, i.e. a muscle fiber, the electrical potential then causes the synapse to release a chemical that then diffuses across a very small gap to interact with proteins on the adjacent cell or muscle fiber, or what have you. 
So the brain is really a hybrid of chemical and electrical processes. That's right. We go from input onto a neuron is chemical that excites the cell, where a synapse is made onto the dendritic tree. It causes a small change in the membrane voltage. We call it membrane potential. And if enough synapses are activated, that change in membrane voltage will cause then that neuron to fire action potentials. Those are the electrical activity that is propagated along the axon. That goes to the end of the axon, activating the synapse to release a chemical to go across what we call synaptic cleft or gap to activate the next cell. But there's not only activation, there's also inhibition. So to activate a cell, what you need to do is change the membrane potential, which normally is negative, make it a little more positive. So that what happens then at what we call an excitatory synapse is that we let ions that are positively charged into the cell. As the membrane voltage then goes from, say, minus 70, the normal resting potential up to minus 55, then you fire one of these or you generate one of these action potentials then that propagates without decrement all the way down the axon. So you also kind of have like a hybrid between analog and digital. That's right. Absolutely. I explain it to my students this way, too. That is that the synaptic potentials are amplitude sensitive. That is the more active the synapse is, the larger the potential change is on the dendrite on which the synapse is made. So that's what we call an amplitude modulating system. Then when we get to where the action potentials are generated, each action potential is identical in size. So we go from an amplitude modulating system to a frequency modulating system, AM, FM, just like in radio transmission. So the frequent, you code information and based on the frequency at which you generate these action potentials, where at a synapse or also at a sensory neuron, the stronger the stimulus is that the larger this membrane voltage change that occurs. And also at synapses and at sensory receptors, the voltage change lasts for as long as the stimulus lasts, whether it be a sensory stimulus or a synaptic stimulus, whereas the action potentials are all or none events lasting only about a millisecond or two. It's a fascinating uh, arrangement that works very well for us for the most part, but there can be some difficulties. But there are two modes of synaptic transmission, and um, the one we're most familiar with is the one I've just described to you, in which a neuron can be excited by allowing positive ions into the cell or inhibited by allowing negatively charged ions into the cell. To drive an action potential or generate it, you have to cause the cell to become more positive inside. So at an inhibitory synapse, when you're making the cell more negative inside because you're allowing negatively charged ions to enter the cell, you inhibit the cell from firing or generating action potential. This is called neurotransmission, where we have fast excitation and inhibition. It's on a millisecond level. It takes less than a millisecond to activate the proteins on the postsynaptic membrane that open channels allowing the ions to flow into the cell. These potentials last then usually only for 100 milliseconds or so. The second mode of neurotransmission is a little different in that at the synapse, a molecule, we call them neuromodulators, are released that interact with proteins on the postsynaptic membrane that rather than opening channels, interact with enzymes inside the cell. So the enzymes then can do a variety of things. They can change the properties of the neuronal cell membrane itself or the proteins in the membrane. It can affect the enzymes in the cell. 
But most interestingly, it can also affect the expression of genes that are in the nucleus of the cell. It does that by activating enzymes that activate what we call transcription factors that get into the nucleus and then activate the expression of new genes. What does that do? Well, what it means is that with neuromodulation, you're changing the biochemistry of the cell. And if you're changing the biochemistry by causing the expression of new genes, it means you can form new dendritic processes, you can form new synapses, you can do a whole host of things. The big difference between what I've talked about before, neurotransmission, excitation, inhibition, neuromodulation by changing the biochemistry of the postsynaptic cell, even its ability to express certain genes, means that you can change over long periods of time the neurons permanently. And so long-term changes in the brain, memory and learning and things of that sort, are thought to be mediated by neuromodulatory responses. And there's very good evidence for that now, both in invertebrates and vertebrates, that indeed that's what's going on, that you're changing then the structure of neurons, the efficiency and effectiveness of synapses and so on and so forth. Many details need to be worked out, but that's basically it. So you have fast excitation inhibition, that's neurotransmission, slower effects on postsynaptic cells, neuromodulation that take some time to be established, a latency, so to speak, but then they can cause effects on the postsynaptic cells that can last permanently for as long as we live. And it's fascinating that our brain can use the same substance as a neurotransmitter or a neuromodulator. Yeah, we do tend to divide substances into neurotransmitters or neuromodulators, but most substances, at least those that serve as neurotransmitters, can serve both as neurotransmitters or modulators. What the difference is, is the proteins on the postsynaptic membrane. If the proteins are such that when they are activated by the neurotransmitter open a channel, then that's neurotransmission. If, however, they activate a protein linked to intracellular enzyme systems, that's a neuromodulator. And so you have fast neurotransmission, if you will, slow neurotransmission, fast simply exciting or inhibiting a neuron on a very rapid time scale, neuromodulation, much longer time scale, but it can induce permanent changes in the neuron. And neuromodulation, uh, we haven't known much about it only over the last 50 years or so compared to neurotransmission, which goes way back 100 years, 20 years. Now, there are substances that seem to act primarily as neuromodulators. The monoamines, serotonin, dopamine, epinephrine, its other name being adrenaline, all act primarily as neuromodulators. In some cases, at least as far as serotonin is concerned, there is an example where it acts like a transmitter, opening and closing channels. But for the most part, the monoamines then are involved in neuromodulation. And what we know is that upsets of those synapses using those substances often call mental disturbances. I think the evidence, for example, that serotonin is involved in depression is very high. The way we treat depression is by using substances that affect serotonin, synaptic neuromodulation. Of course, there's evidence that dopamine is involved in schizophrenia and so on and so forth. So we often talk about the monoamines being involved in the effective and arousal aspects of neural function. Neuropeptides are also a group of substances released at synapses, but we know very little yet still about what they do. Most of us believe that most of them probably act as neuromodulators, causing long-term changes in the nervous system. But this is uh, not as completely known as I hope it will be in the next 20, 25 years. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about vision, but first we're going to just take a quick little break. 
Today's sponsor is Babbel, the language learning app that will get you speaking a new language with confidence. One of the reasons why I like Babbel is that I'm trying to learn Spanish because there are a lot of Spanish-speaking immigrants moving into my area, and I'd really like to be able to communicate with them. With Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, and it's designed to get you up and going within a few weeks with very short 15-minute lessons. And best of all, you can use it on the app or online and your progress gets synced. You can try Babbel for free. Just go to babbel.com or download the app today and try it for free. That's Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L, B as in boy, dot com. Or download the app to try it for free. With Babbel, you can speak a new language with confidence. I know that you've spent your entire career studying vision, and there's an excellent discussion of this in the book that complements what I read in your book about vision. Uh, I guess it's the highlights. So let's start out with an overview of the relationship between the eye and the brain. All right. I will correct you a little bit, the eye and the brain. Because the eye is part of the brain. It was a trick question. Yeah. The critical (laughs) part of the eye that is involved in really establishing vision, the retina of the eye, and I'll tell you about that in just a second, is a true piece of the brain. It's pushed out into the eye during development. And so my career has been spent studying the retina of the eye as a model piece of the brain. But let's back up just a little bit and say a little bit about the eye. Let's consider it as it has been by many people as a camera. That is, in a camera, you have allowing light to come in to the camera, a lens that focuses the image onto the film that's on the back of the camera. Now, if we think of the eye, we have two structures in the front of the eye, the cornea and the lens, which focus images and allow then images, sharp images, to focus onto the retina of the eye. The retina of the eye consists not only of photoreceptors, which interestingly enough sit at the back of the retina, but also, in addition to the photosensitive elements, the photoreceptor cells, we find four major classes of neurons in the retina that begin the process of analyzing the visual image before the information, the visual information, leaves the eye. So we start with the photoreceptors that receive the light, respond to the light, they pass on their message to second-order cells, of which there are two major classes. One is the so-called bipolar cell that carries the information from the outer retina to the inner retina. Bipolar cells get their input then directly from the photoreceptors. There's also a second cell in the outer retina, the horizontal cell, that carries information laterally in the outer retina and begins the process of analyzing the visual image, and I'll explain that in just a minute in a little bit more detail. So the outer retina, the information is transmitted to the inner retina by the bipolar cells, which come into contact, synaptic contact, with two other types of cells, ganglion cells, which are the third order cells in the retina. It's their axons that run along the surface of the retina collected the optic disc, forming the optic nerve. Then there's also another cell type in the inner retina called an amacrine cell that spreads its processes laterally in the inner retina and is involved in integrating information in the inner part of the retina. So that's the basic structure of the retina. Your photoreceptors receive the light, passing on the information to the bipolar and horizontal cells in the outer retina. 
Then from there, the bipolar cells provide the input to the inner retina, where the bipolar cells come into synaptic contact with the ganglion cells, the output neurons of the retina, and then amacrine cells. So what's going on? What's going on in the outer retina and the inner retina? Well, this is a very general overview. Essentially, in the outer retina, what we find is that the bipolar cells receive input from a limited number of photoreceptor cells. So they're telling the brain, essentially, where light is falling on the retina. They're carrying out a spatial type of analysis, if you will. The horizontal cells then provide inhibition from distant photoreceptors to the bipolar cells so that when you record from a bipolar cell, you find that there's a small region of the retina, which when you illuminate the retina will respond to light. It's called the receptive field. And in the outer retina, the receptive field consists of two concentric rings, an inner ring, which responds to direct stimulation of the photoreceptors, an outer ring, which responds to illumination of surrounding photoreceptors that affect the bipolar cell via the horizontal cell. So that you find then that the receptive fields then consist of a central excitatory zone surrounded by an inhibitory zone. Or, there are two classes of these cells, a central inhibitory zone surrounded by an excitatory zone. What does that do for you? Well, what we know, for example, is that the light that you perceive doesn't depend necessarily exactly on how many photons, how bright a light is falling on the photoreceptors, but what the intensity of light is relative to the surround. We've all seen the classic pictures of a circle of a certain intensity surrounded by white light. The same circle surrounded by black light, they look quite different. The one surrounded by dark looks much brighter than the same circle, same intensity circle surrounded by light. So we see that already in the outer retina. That's the kind of processing that's going on. We talk of it as a spatial process. But we also see the beginning of color processing in the outer retina, where the central region of the receptive field responds to light of one color, the surround light of another color. What does that mean? Well, what it means, again, something that we've all experienced, and that is that colors look very different depending on the surrounding color. No one picks out some material for draperies or for material to cover a couch without bringing a swatch of that material home to see what it looks like in the environment, which has, you know, many different colors. And it's surprising how different a color can look depending on the surrounding color. Yeah, I got my house painted a few months ago, and it's amazing how it looks like the rooms are different colors, even though it's all the same color, just because of the light. Right, exactly. And that's because of the surrounding area. So we have then in the outer retina, what's going on is spatial analysis and the beginnings of color analysis. In the inner retina, what we find is many of the cells are movement sensitive so that the information coming into the inner retina is then analyzed in terms of its dynamics, its temporal properties, if you will. So basically then we have the outer retina interested in spatial and color properties of an image. The inner retina involved much more in the temporal properties of the image. And then we have a, a number of different types of third-order ganglion cells which transmit these initial analyses to the rest of the brain. So the retina is indeed a true piece of the brain, again, as I mentioned earlier, pushed out into the eye during development. So then after, who do the ganglion cells talk to? They go on to the rest of the brain. Now, for conscious vision, what we're aware of for the most part, the ganglion cells go on to the lateral geniculate nucleus in the midbrain, that structure called the thalamus. What happens there is that all sensory information except for smell, before it's transmitted to the cortex, 
what's critical about the cortex is that information getting the cortex, for the most part, we're very much aware of, we're conscious of. Again, the thalamus serves as a gating mechanism. It can increase the amount of sensory information going to a particular part of the brain or decrease it. So it plays sort of a gating function. It's not all that well understood, even at this point in time. So where the information goes then is to the cortex. Visual information goes to the back of the brain, the occipital cortex, the very back of the brain to an area called area V1, where we find then the image is analyzed in different ways. So, for example, whereas in the retina, you can get a ganglion cell to be vigorously activated by a spot of light, especially if the spot of light is in the center of the receptive field. When you get to area V1, what you find is that beyond the few cells right around where the input is to the visual cortex from the lateral geniculate nucleus, the cells respond much better to a bar of light rather than a spot of light. And so we find cells that have a requirement for orientation in area V1. We talk about those as simple cells. Those are the first cells we see in the visual cortex. And since the cell has to have a specific orientation, it means that for any region then in the cortex, we'll find something like 18 to 20 cells that have different orientation specificities. Now, from the simple cells, which we find clustered mainly around the input layers to the cortex, we find more complex cells, which are called complex cells. And these are cells that, again, have a requirement for orientation, usually of a bar, or it can be an edge of light, but the complex cells require the bar to be moving and moving at right angles to the orientation of the bar. Then we get to more complex cells. We call them specialized complex cells, and I'm glossing over lots and lots of details, but we get to specialized complex cells, which then have a requirement for movement only in a specific direction, what we call directionally selective cells, so that we see a hierarchy of cells when we get to V1, spreading out from the input layers from the lateral geniculate nucleus in both upward and downward directions. So we go from center surround cells that come in, cells that have receptive fields or axons that have receptive fields, center surround, then to neurons which have the orientation-specific requirement, the simple cells, and then we go from there to the complex cells that have a requirement for orientation of the bar or edge has to be moving to even more complex cells where the bar has to be moving, but only in a specific direction. Are all those still in V1, or are you talking about other cortical areas? I'm talking only about V1 right now, only about V1. And it's in V1 that we also see for the first time information from the two eyes coming together. Both in eyes, obviously, the information between the two eyes is kept separate, but it's also kept separate in the lateral geniculate nucleus. And then the information from the two eyes is combined in area V1. But we find in area V1 cells that respond primarily just to one eye or the other. Other cells that respond equally to both eyes, but the bulk of the cells will respond better to one eye than the other. We call that ocular dominance. Now, what is important about information coming from both eyes? Well, this is the basis for seeing things in depth, and you require both eyes to do that. So, for example, if you simply oppose your two index fingers, close one eye, separate the fingers, keep your head steady, now try to oppose the two fingers. More often than not, you'll miss very significantly doing that. Whereas if you have both eyes open, you can do it easily. That's depth perception. All of that's going on right in area V1. So that we have a hierarchy of cells. What we do also is we have hierarchy in terms of ocular dominance, how equally 
uh, cell is driven by both eyes and so on and so forth. And so what we have in the cortex is then modules. They're called hypercolumns in which we have all the machinery necessary to analyze a bit of visual space. So we find then these modules all across the visual cortex, telling us then about what is going on in a particular part of visual space. You with me still? Yep. Okay, because it's getting complicated. But it's all there in area V1. So one of the great features of, uh, and this was a wonderful work carried out by two physicians, initially at Johns Hopkins University and then at Harvard Medical School, Torsten Weasel and David Hubel. And for this work, they won a Nobel Prize in the early 80s. It was spectacular work. And it really showed for the first time how we begin to analyze sensory information coming in. And the general principle is that you begin to take pieces, if you will, of the visual image and encode those pieces in various neurons. Sort of an abstraction process, if you will. At least that's the way I think of it. And the further along the visual system you go, the more precise is the stimulus you have to put into the eye to drive the cell. In the retina, all you needed was spots of light. Area V1, oriented bars of light. Higher up in V1, bars of light that are moving in either direction. Then higher up still, bars of light moving in a specific direction, and so on and so forth. So now, what happens after area V1? Most visual information goes on to area V2. And what we find in area V2 is that there are bands of cells, some of which are primarily responsive just to movement, others primarily to oriented lines, others that seem to be most interested in color. Didn't say anything about color in terms of the module, but there are specific regions in the middle of these modules that respond selectively to color. So we begin then to see, as we move from area V1 to area V2, that we're now segregating form. Those are the oriented cells. They tell you about the form of an image. Others movement, others color. So we find from area V2 that we go to probably three separate areas. An area called V5, which is selective for movement, Area V4, which seems to be primarily involved in form. And then finally, an area not as well defined. Some people call it V8, which seems to be concerned primarily with color. What is the significance of that? What are the implications of that? Well, we now have some clinical cases, a very famous one described by Oliver Sacks, first in the New York Review of Books, of a painter who was driving in New York City one day and he was hit by another car. He seemed to be all right. He went home and um, went to bed, very tired, woke up the next day and discovered he couldn't see color. And he was an abstract painter, the case of the colorblind painter, it was called. It was also in one of his anthologies. And what almost certainly happened was that there was damage to his color-sensitive areas in the brain, whereas he could see black and white objects perfectly well, and he could see moving objects perfectly well. He had no color vision at all. Of course, for him, it was devastating because his art was based on color, abstract color paintings. Interestingly enough, to make a very long story short, he went back to art, but mainly sculpture, black and white drawings. And he also became a night person because what he said was that he knew that colors were so vivid in the day he couldn't see them that he preferred to work and live at night. Because you can't really see colors at night very well. People who have had strokes or lesions in area V5, they can't see moving objects. They can see color perfectly well, they can see static objects perfectly well, but they can't tell, for example, if a car is coming at them when they go to cross the road. They say, I look and I see a car in the distance, 
And uh, I looked the other way, and all of a sudden the car's much closer, but I couldn't see it moving. They can't pour tea into a cup because they say it looks solid. So what they do is they pour it and it overflows because they can't tell that the fluid is rising in the cup and so on and so forth. Where does information, visual information, go beyond areas five, four, and eight? Two major pathways of information flow. One which goes dorsally in the cortex towards into the parietal lobe, which tells people about where things are in space. So it tells you where things are in space so that you can grab it appropriately or what have you. That's called the where pathway. Where are things? Then another pathway of information flow, primarily V4 and V8, heads ventrally in the brain into various nuclei, which seem to be involved then providing us information about color and form. And one of the more interesting areas is well down the so-called what pathway in what is called the inferior temporal cortex, which seems to be specialized for recognizing faces. It's been known in the clinic that people who've had lesions in those areas cannot recognize people they know very well, even their spouses. They'll walk into the room, they'll see that it's a person, They don't know who it is, but as soon as the person begins to talk, they recognize the voice. So it's clearly a visual defect. And uh, there's been a lot of excitement recently about face recognition and face cells because it's turning out that there may be as many as six different groups, or they're called patches of face cells. And the various patches are interested in some aspect of a face how far the eyes are apart, how high the forehead is, and so on and so forth. And so the guess is that those patches then feed into cells that allow you to recognize specific people. So what do you think is the most important lesson that vision tells us about how the brain works? I think I've almost described that, and that is is that indeed what seems to happen in the visual system And I think it holds also for other systems as well, although we know more about the visual system than any other sensory system. But that you take an image that falls on the retina, and then you begin to analyze it. Right there in the outer retina, the image that you see depends on the surrounding image in a way. Color anyway, brightness holds for. It even holds for context in the sense that if you have two pictures and you put somebody in an inappropriate place, they look very different than they do when they're in an appropriate place. The visual system seems to take pieces of the visual image and break it down into component parts. Again, whether it's light or dark and what the surround's telling you. Then lines, movement, color, so on and so forth. It separates that first into uh, different aspects of the cell physiology, then into separate cells, and so on and so forth. And that leads us to one of the biggest questions. The binding problem. The binding problem. You've got it right there. How does it all come back together again? We really don't have a clue. (laughs) We know it does, but how that happens, we do not know. Yeah, the binding problem remains one of the the major problems that are facing us. How does it all come together? Now, when I say other systems seem to have similar aspects to the visual system, so, for example, of course, we have sensory cells all over our body that respond to touch or pressure or what have you. And when they've looked, for example, in the visual cortex, at what we call these somatosensory cells that respond to touch, what you find is that there's a small area on a digit or on the arm or wherever that responds to the touch of that area, very much like the bipolar cells in the retina. But, and this is where the similarity is striking, is what you do find is that very often these touch cells, they have a small receptive field on, say, a digit, in which if you stimulate by touching the center of the receptive field, you get excitation. If what you do is now touch at the same time, 
the surrounding region, you inhibit the central region. So you have a center surround organization of the receptive field, very much like what we find in the visual system. And then there are other cells that respond better to movement along the skin and some cells that respond even better when the movement is in one direction. So again, movement sensitivity, which we see in the inner retina, movement sensitivity in a specific direction, which we see in the cortex, at least in, in the mammals, all that seems to be going on also in the somatosensory system. There are other similarities as well. Of course, in the auditory system, you find that there are cells in the cortex that respond to various frequencies. But I don't know that literature as well as I know about the somatosensory or certainly the visual system. John, we're, we're kind of running out of time, so I want to give you a chance. Is there something that you really wanted to share today that we kind of missed as we were going along? We certainly have covered a lot of territory. Yeah, we have covered a lot. What are the most exciting things going on right now in neuroscience? Something that probably we need to emphasize is brain plasticity. I haven't really talked about that. Again, some of the critical early work was again done in the visual system. And it may be best to start there. What we've all known for a long time is that the young brain is much more plastic than is the brain of us older people. (laughs) Youngsters can learn languages They're language machines. All they need to do is hear a language if you're up to six years of age and you can learn it flawlessly without an accent. In fact, it was thought for a long time that once the brain was completely formed by age 20, it was hardwired. You couldn't really modify it. Well, that's changing. Let me give you a couple of examples where that is changing. But let's go back to the visual system. This is Hubel and Weasel working again. What they asked was the following question. It's a nature-nurture question. Suppose we take a newborn cat or monkey who's visually inexperienced. What do the cells look like? Are they fairly adult-like, or are they totally dependent just on the environment that they're now in? The answer is that they're remarkably adult-like in the newborn visually inexperienced cat and monkey. So, for example, if you record from area V1, you find simple cells, complex cells, specialized complex cells, et cetera, et cetera. And here's the big but. If now, in that young animal, you alter the visual environment, you can substantially alter the properties of the neurons. And that was shown best by studying ocular dominance, where in the visually inexperienced animal, you found all, you know, most of the cells in the cortex were getting input from both eyes, although some on either end were getting it just from one eye, but the great bulk of cells got input from both eyes. Now, suppose what you do is you prevent sharp images from falling on one eye, one eye only. You come back two to three months later, you record from the cortex and what you find if there are virtually no binocular cells, almost all the cells are getting their input from the open eye that was getting normal visual stimulation. If you look at the anatomy, what you find is that the open eye has taken over much of the closed eye area in the cortex, showing that there's enormous plasticity. You see the all, also the same thing in humans. If, for example, you have crossed eyes, What the brain does is ignore the information from the eye that's crossed so that the individual, the child, ignores the information coming from the crossed eye. And so it only uses the good eye. And again, from animal experiments, there's evidence that the good eye is taking over cortical territory from the crossed eye. How do you treat it? Well, a trick the ophthalmologist long used was to straighten the eyes but then to patch the good eye, forcing the child to use the deprived eye. And that works surprisingly well. But that was thought all to stop at about age 8, 10, something like that. But now we've come to realize that indeed there still remains some plasticity, even in the adult brain. We've known, of course, I like to say, 
at my age, that, uh, of course, we can all remember things even when we're in our 70s and 80s. That is an example of plasticity, example of neuromodulation, if you will, still operating in the brain. The question was, what about improvement of crossed eyes and visual deprivation and what have you? Well, it's beginning to appear that with certain manipulation, what you can do is get the brain to respond by growing new processes, forming new synapses, and so on and so forth, even in the adult. And some of the best experiments done on this were done on the somatosensory cortex that's in the parietal lobe, where there are separate regions devoted to innervation from the five digits we have in our hands. So, for example, this was done by a fellow by the name of of Mizernik, Mike Mizernik at UCSF, where if he cut the nerve from one digit of a monkey and then recorded from the areas that corresponded to each of the five digits of the monkey, what initially you found was that when you tried to record from the cells in which the input, the sensory input has been deprived, you get no responses. But then if you wait, for a couple of weeks or longer, then what you find is that the cells in this area begin to respond, and they're responding to the adjacent fingers, which again indicate in the adult brain that you can get process growth, new synapse growth, and so on and so forth. And one of the most interesting um, recent observations in support of this has come from brain imaging studies of violin players. As you well know, you hold a violin in your left hand and you have four fingers that are used to finger the violin. The right hand is used to hold a bow and no motor specialty is required except for the index finger and the thumb to hold the bow. If you now look at the amount of cortex devoted to the fingers from the left fingering hand, the amount of cortex that you see devoted to those fingers is greater than on the other side where you have the fingers involved just in holding the bow. Very dramatic. You see the changes best in younger people, but even in adolescents and young adults, you see a difference. So there again, you're seeing that there's plasticity well beyond the very early ages of an animal or human life. We used to call that, we call it the critical period. Now we call it the most sensitive period. So I always like to close by asking my guests for advice for students. Advice for students. Well, you know, (laughs) I could give so much it would last for the next hour, (laughs) perhaps. And of course, my day was a little different from today. I think I mentioned very early on as I always enjoyed building things, working with my hand, taking things apart, seeing if I could put it back together again. And I think that led me into science. That's why I so much enjoy being in the laboratory. When you do an experiment, you design an experiment, and you get it to work, and then even more so when you can confirm that experiment, you now know something almost no one else in the world probably knows. Nothing that's more satisfying than that, in my view. Too many of our youngsters, my children and grandchildren included, spending too much time looking at cell phones and computers these days and are missing out in the joy of building things and making things on their own. And so, but that includes not only building things and making things and so on, taking things apart, but activities in general. Why I think sports are so important so that you're doing things and hand-eye coordination and all that. I think that that's really important. Is it harder to teach students to be competent in the lab than it used to be? Or is the changing skills sort of make it hard to tell? I'm not so sure about that. But I can tell you about something else that relates to this. And that is that one of my grandchildren was applying to go to the school. And um, my wife and I went with her and her parents to the school, which was having an open house. And uh, when they int- we started the introductions, they talked about this new program 
uh, STEM program, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, that was something brand new, and they were all excited about it, whereas uh, my granddaughter and my, and my wife went off to a, another class in humanities. I decided to go to this STEM class. Well, I, we walked in, and, and the teacher was terrific, and she then said she had a puzzle for all the students who were in the room. And she gave them each 12 straws and a baseball and said, build a structure that would support the baseball. Well, you know, not one kid could do it. And I thought, wow, that's the kind of thing we were doing all the time when we were growing up. And I guess I'm just showing my age. Building things, taking things apart, putting them back together again, seeing what worked and what didn't work. In other words, using hands. So where I think I've seen it with my with our students is I find so many of them can't draw anything, especially in the freshman seminar that we've read about what a neuron looks like. And I'll say to one of the students, draw me a neuron. And they immediately say, I can't draw. I'm sort of taken aback. And I come to realize that they don't spend time doing that kind of activity. And I think that is a bit of a problem. You know, I used to love to draw. And of course, Reading is another issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had some wonderful guests on about reading, so we can leave that for another day. I really appreciate you um, talking with me. I hope it is useful. I had fun doing it. Thank you very much for asking me, and uh, I hope you liked it. I appreciated having Dr. John Dowling on to talk about his new book, Understanding the Brain. I wanted to focus on vision because it gives us an opportunity to sort of look at all the levels that he talked about, neurobiology, systems biology, and even cognitive neuroscience. Understanding the Brain is really aimed at a non-specialist audience. It's intended to update his book from the 90s called Creating Mind. As Dr. Dowling noted how the brain works is of interest to people working in a wide range of fields, including philosophy, linguistics, and computer science. It's really difficult to do justice to this kind of book in a podcast interview, which is why I wanted to focus a bit on vision, but we did hit a few other highlights. When I asked Dr. Dowling how neurons differ from other cells in the body, he pointed out two things the fact that neurons can't reproduce, and the fact that they rely on oxygen because unlike many other cells in the body, they are not capable of anaerobic metabolism. These two facts have many implications, especially in clinical settings, but I was surprised that he didn't mention their ability to communicate via action potentials. When I brought this up, he emphasized the chemical processes that are involved and that it is important to remember that the brain is something of a hybrid using both electrical and chemical signaling. That's one way that it differs from a man-made digital computer. Some of you may remember that analog computers were once popular for doing things like simulating rocket launches. That's why I made the comment that it's almost like the brain is a hybrid computer. I appreciated that Dr. Dowling also helped clarify some terminology. He pointed out that neurotransmitters act directly on the channels that are in the cell wall of the postsynaptic neuron, while neuromodulators interact with enzymes inside the cell to do a wide variety of things, including changing genetic expression. As Dowling pointed out, neuromodulators change the biochemistry of the cell. We spent the last half of the interview talking a little bit more about vision, starting with the fact that the retina in the back of the eye is actually part of the brain, and signal processing actually begins in the retina with two layers of processing. The outer layer communicates where light is falling on the retina, while the inner layer begins color processing. We talked briefly about how our perception of color is always context dependent. This begins at the retina. The inner retina is also sensitive to movement. He described this as a temporal property as opposed to the spatial processing of the outer retina. 
There are several different cell types in the retina, but the ganglion cells are the ones that form the optic nerve and transmit signals to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. Other scientists are unraveling what is happening here, and we have come to appreciate that the processing that goes on here influences what is finally transmitted to the cortex, starting at the area called V1. Once we get to the cortex, the processing becomes much more complicated and more specialized, with some areas responding to bars of light with particular orientations and others to movements in certain directions. We also talked about how information from the two eyes is necessary for depth perception. Dr. Dowling went into a great deal of detail during the discussion, and I can imagine that that could be quite intimidating. However, unless you're planning to work in this field, it's fine to focus on the big picture, such as the fact that some areas of the cortex seem to do very specialized functions. We know this from the odd deficits people sometimes experience after injuries or strokes. Dowling gave the example of the painter who lost the ability to see color and even the ability to imagine color. Another striking example was a woman who could no longer cross the street because she could not perceive motion, including the motion of cars. One of the weirder deficits is not being able to recognize faces. Oliver Sacks wrote a lot about this since it was a deficit he coped with for many years. The fact that all these different brain areas seem so specialized leads us back to the so-called binding problem. How do we perceive what we see in a unified way? The irony is, even though vision is the most studied of the senses, as Dr. Dowling said, we really don't have a clue. Near the end of the interview, Dr. Dowling brought up the importance of brain plasticity. This is a topic that we've covered a lot on this podcast. So if you're new to brain science, I encourage you to listen to these older episodes. The easiest way to find an episode about a particular topic is to go to brainsciencepodcast.com and use the search box that appears at the top of the right sidebar on most pages except the homepage. When I was preparing for this interview, I actually read two books, Understanding the Brain, From Cells to Behavior to Cognition, and Vision, How it Works and What Can Go Wrong. Understanding the Brain is a good book if you're just getting started and want a nice, broad overview. Vision is a great book if you would like to know more of the particulars about the current knowledge of vision neuroscience. I'm going to close with just a few announcements, and I appreciate if you listen to the end. One thing that I don't talk much about is the fact that Brain Science has a free mobile app. It's available for iOS, Android, and Windows phones. This app is most popular with premium subscribers because it's a great way to access premium content. But the app also allows me to post extra free content. I haven't done this recently, but this month I will be posting episode four, which is about Dr. Dowling's older book, The Great Brain Debate. It's a fairly short episode, and you might enjoy hearing how far we've come since that episode was posted way back in early 2007. Just go to episode 153 inside the Brain Science app and look for episode extras. In November 2018, Brain Science passed 10 million downloads, but I still rely on listeners like you to help new people find the show. One thing that influences our rank in iTunes is reviews, so it would help me a lot if you would post a review, even if you listen in another app. I know this takes extra effort, so I'm going to start giving away free books and Amazon gift certificates to people who send me a screenshot of their latest review in iTunes. There will be two winners every month. After each episode, the first person who sends me a screenshot of their review will have a choice of this month's book or an Amazon gift card. Everyone else who sends me a screenshot will go into a drawing that will be held at the end of each month, right before a new episode is released. If your name isn't drawn, you will remain eligible for future drawings. With your help, I hope we can double the audience by the end of the year. Of course, as we move forward into 2019, your financial support of brain science remains critical. 
You can learn how to support my work by going to brainsciencepodcast.com forward slash donations. Finally, I want to remind you that Brain Science is now available in Pandora. You can subscribe there just like you do in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever your favorite podcasting app is. If you use an app where you can't find Brain Science, please let me know so I can fix that. Thanks again for listening. Please visit brainsciencepodcast.com and I look forward to talking with you again next month. Brain Science is a copyright 2019 to Virginia Campbell, MD. You can copy this episode to share it with others, but for any other uses or derivatives, please contact me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. The new theme music for the Brain Science Podcast is Mindfire by Tony Catraccia. You can find his work at syncopationnow.com.